I'm Jen Walton. I am the co-director of the MBL Hui Library and the MBL Archivist. The library at MBL holds the institutional archives as well as some items from MBL's history. MBL was founded in 1888. The impetus for starting the MBL came from a few places. In 1873 and 1874, on Penakis, which is one of the Elizabeth Islands, a chain of islands that stretch southeast from Latoll, there was a school called the Anderson School of Natural History. For those two years, it operated, um, and, then it, and then it closed. From 1881 to 1887, north of Boston, there was the Anasquam Lab, which was a school that was started by the Boston Women's Educational Association and the Natural History Society of Boston. Those two groups came together, formed a lab that was headed by Alpheus Hyatt. Although that lab ran for seven years, it was not particularly successful. But what it did do was it convinced the Women's Educational Association and the Natural History Society that there actually was a need for a national laboratory in U.S. for marine research. The U.S. Fish Commission, shown here, this is their first building in, in Woods Hole, it was started in Woods Hole in 1877. Spencer Baird was the head of the, the U.S. Fish Commission at that time, and he, was a, he knew Alpheus Hyatt. Hyatt had been a student on Penakees, um, and so he knew this area, but Baird convinced him that this really was the best place to do marine research. We have the warmer waters of the Gulf Stream that come up from the south, and from the north we have the Labrador current that comes down. So in Cape Cod, those two currents are commingling, and they're bringing lots of a wide diversity of organisms to this area. Also in Woods Hole, there are um, no rivers that come out. There are lots of bays and coves in this area that are great for exploring and for collecting, but there isn't any fresh water that would dilute the salinity at different times of the year, so that made it a good place to do research as well. The Marine Biological Laboratory was officially established in March of 1888. The trustees elected Alpheus Hyatt to be the first president of the corporation and settled on Charles Otis Whitman as the first director of the lab. The lab was created to offer both instruction and the opportunity for individual investigation for both men and women. Whitman was selected to be the director of the lab. He had been a student at, on the School of Penakees as well, um, but he was serving as the director of the Alice Lake Lab in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which at the time was one of only two research institutions in the U.S. Whitman left Alice Lake, went to become a professor at Clark University, and then went on to the University of Chicago to start, when the university was started, to establish their biology department. Whitman continued on during that time as the director of MBL, so that connection between the University of Chicago and Marine Biological Lab go back to the first director, Charles Whitman. Whitman was told by the trustees they wanted him to open the lab in July of 1888, just a few months away. So a wooden frame building was quickly put up, and the scientific equipment that had been used in Anasquam was brought down to, be, to serve as a scientific equipment here the first year. The Women's Educational Association gave that to the MBL to be able to start the first year. This was the circular that was sent out that first year as well, trying to drum up students and investigators to come. The problem was that this circular was sent out in June of 1888, asking people to come for the, in the next month. So the response was not that great in the first year, but the year, first year was a big success. Whitman was enthusiastically determined to make MBL a national laboratory. Not one that was connected to a college or a university, but one that was independent, and Whitman also had the vision that it would be run by the investigators. So those first years, everybody that came to the MBL was offered the option of joining the corporation and for, for the sum of a dollar a year, which made it fairly affordable for, mo for most people. 
This, this is showing the interior of that first building that was built. This is in 1888. There were two floors. There was a floor for instruction, and then this is showing you the investigators area. There were, in that first summer, there were seven investigators who came. Four of them were women. You can see them working here at the tables. A, an individual or a college or a university would rent one of these tables that they could come and then use for the summer. In the middle of the photo, there's the seawater tank where they could keep their organisms that they were going to be working on. In the back corner, you can see there's the library the first year, um, which also needed some, some help as well. The, there were no electric lights. In, in the lab this first year. Uh, you can see the large windows and the uh, light lamps on the table. So most of the research had to be done during the day. And in the evenings, the researchers could talk about their research with one another and ask each other questions. And this is where the tradition of the evening lectures started at MBL. And this continues on to today with the Friday evening lectures that are held here every summer. This shows the first building at MBL um, a few years later, four years later, in fact, the building had almost tripled in size. And by 1895, there were almost 200 people at MBL in the summer. In the opening year, MBL offered a single course, zoology. The, and the students in that course the first year tended to be novice investigators, high school teachers and college teachers who had not had the opportunity to do the type of scientific research that was being done here in Woods Hole. Five years later, the courses had expanded to ha so that there were four courses. There was botany, embryology, physiology, and zoology. Of those four courses, embryology and physiology are still offered at MBL today. In the beginning years, there were not people hired to do the collecting. So the students and investigators needed to find the organisms that they wanted to work on and bring them back to the lab. But pretty soon, the investigators couldn't support that. And so MBL hired captains and professional collectors and, and purchased boats to be able to go a little bit further afield and get the, the organisms that they needed. And this shows one of the boats here that was being used used for collection. However, the students still would go out collecting, and often from the shore. Um, this shows a party of, of students, out, students doing their, their collecting um, in rather what we would consider rather fancy dress these days. But the professional collectors were important to MBL because they had a knowledge of the mating habits of the organisms, the feeding habits, and where they, where they could be found, or where, what they like to have as their habitat. And so all of this information was also important for the investigators to have as they were doing their research. And although MBL was established in Woods Hole to have access to marine life, Whitman saw it as a place to study all biology. In the annual report for the first year, Whitman wrote, but what are the special attractions of marine life? that naturalists so eagerly seek the seashore is a question that sometimes asked. To this, we must reply the, that the ocean is the home of the lowest as well as the oldest forms of life. And it is such forms that the mysteries of life can presumably be most nearly approached. So much of the research in, interest in the early days involves studies of developmental biology. In the 1890s, researchers were focused on how an egg is fertilized and how the embryo begins to develop. Whitman had pioneered the technique of cell lineage studies in 1878, um, doing a cell lineage study of, a, of the leech. This involved closely watching and tracking the cells, as, as cell divisions as the embryos developed. Edmund Beecher Wilson, Edwin Grant Conklin, F.R. Lilly, and T.H. Morgan took on the study of different organisms. This was painstaking work. Marine embryos were necessary for this kind of work, though, because they're small, they're plentiful, they're easily harvested, and they develop quickly. So you can actually watch several cell divisions happen in the course of a night. Conklin did, his, did some of his research on the crepitula, the slipper shell, and really, really took great pains to 
carefully track the cells as they were dividing. Here at MBL, we, we have some of his publications, and we also have some of the slides that he was using as he actually did that work. As the 1890s progressed, scientists were not content to merely watch the development, but started doing experimental manipulation of the embryos. Jacques Lerb, who was the founder of the MBL physiology course, was at MBL in 1899, and he made one of the most important discoveries of his career. Lerb was interested in the mechanisms that drive fertilization. It was known that fertilization required the sperm and the egg, but what wasn't exactly known was what caused the embryo to form when they came together, and this intrigued Lerb. Lerb set out with buckets of sea urchins to figure out this problem. Sea urchins were, and still are, a widely used organism to study development. He took unfertilized embryos and began mixing them with various solutions of seawater and different chemicals. And he realized that if he soaked the eggs in a mixture of seawater and magnesium chloride, he could get them to develop to advanced stages. So using a few chemicals, Lerb could get sea urchins, which are sexually reproducing, to develop without sperm. Lerb called this phenomenon artificial parthenogenesis, and it was revolutionary. Newspapers around the country caught up with this, got caught up with this idea, and they published some sensational headlines. However, this was really MBL's first widely reported breakthrough of research that was done here. T.H. Morgan is another example of the changes that science science at MBL went through in the early years. In 1894 at Johns Hopkins, he wrote his dissertation on the development of the sea, uh, sea spiders and doing those cell, cell lineage studies. However, he quickly became interested in the work that European, some European scientists were doing with more manipulation of the embryos. Like Lerb, Morgan was manipulating the embryos of sea urchins and sea stars. And scientists in the 19th century were less likely to focus on one organism and more likely to, to look at different organisms and ask different questions use, using them. Morgan published on over 30 organisms in the course of his career, asking different questions of them. While he was here at MBL, he spent some time looking at regeneration in planaria, little worms that he found in the, in the ponds around Woods Hole. Regeneration was another area that in the early 1900s that there was a lot of interest in at MBL, and there continues to be researchers today at MBL who work on regeneration. In 1933, Morgan won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his demonstration of genetic inheritance in fruit flies, Drosophila Madagascar. He was able to show that the some of them had a mutation of white eyes and that that was carried on the chromosome. Most of Morgan's Drosophila work was not done, at, was done at Columbia University, not here at Woods Hole, but Morgan continued to come back to Woods Hole every summer until his death in 1945, or most summers, and asking new questions and seeking new marine organisms to ask those questions of. Whitman was a strong leader, and he pushed the MBL into becoming much more than probably had been envisioned by the original founders. However, by 1908, Whitman's research interests had changed to pigeons, and it was harder to bring the pigeons to Woods Hole to do that, that research. He was then at the University of Chicago. And also the financial realities and administrative burdens of running the lab year in and year out had begun to, begun to wear on Whitman. The second director of the MBL, was Frank Lilly. Lilly had studied under Whitman. He was the assistant chair at the University of Chicago under Whitman, and he was the assistant director of MBL before taking over. One thing that Lilly had that Whitman lacked was access to money and funders. Whitman's brother-in-law was Charles Crane, who had made a fortune in plumbing fixtures, and so he was able to help support the MBL in 1913. Crane put up the money to build the first permanent building at MBL. They referred to it as a permanent building because it was made out of brick and not a wood frame structure that could potentially burn down. So this is the Crane building here. You can see it sort of lonely sitting here on the, the hill with the candle house next door. 
This was a brief overview of the first 25 years of MBL. If you're interested in finding out more about the history of MBL, please visit our special collections page on the library website and you'll find more resources there. Thank you. <laughs>